Why would someone who says they believe God's promises try to make it happen on their own? We're in a series called Courageous Faith, and it's based on one chapter of the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11. And it is a chapter about not all of the heroes, but many great heroes of the faith. And today I'm going to just kind of go out of order, uh, skip ahead a little bit, and land on uh, the story of the hero named Sarah. Another hero named Sarah. Yeah, we have, we have another one right here uh, in church this morning. Since it's Mother's Day, I wanted to, to, uh, to talk about one of the, the female heroes in this list. In Hebrews chapter 11... Verse 11, and I want you to just have your Bible open to that or your, your smartphone if, you, if you've got it. Pull out the Bible app and let's go. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. It was by faith that even Sarah, that's, a, that's odd that he, this writer would say it this way. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child. Though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child. Though she was barren, she had no resources. And she was too old. She was out of time. But she believed that God would keep his promise. Wow, Sarah sounds like a hero of the faith. She sounds like a giant. And it's uh, for, for good reason. She was chosen by God to be the matriarch kind of the first first lady of Israel, when God was building a new nation of people to be his special people. You might have heard, uh, read in the Bible, God many times refers to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sarah is Abraham's wife. So she's right there with the first patriarch, and it's pretty cool. By the way, when they were younger, Abraham and Sarah had different names. They were known as Abram and Sarai. Abram and Sarai. Well, Sarai faced two giant obstacles. And in her day and age, they were big. These were big obstacles. And it was that she was barren. Her body had never been able to get pregnant. She was, we would say, infertile. And now, at this point in her life, when, we, when her story really heats up, she was too old to get pregnant. She was 90 years old. And even if she had a fertile body, it was too late for her to have a child. She was already past the menopause. But this verse that we read, Hebrews 11:11, 11, 11, says, By faith, even Sarah, or Sarai as she was known earlier, was able to have a child. She believed that God would keep his promise. Now, in that day, it it was considered very important for a woman to to get married, to be in a family, and to have a child. Uh, You think about it, the children were your workers on your farm or in your business. It it, it was sort of a status symbol. It was really expected in that day that every woman would have a child. So the the fact that she was barren and now she was too old, this this was devastating to her. But the Bible says in Hebrews 11.11, she believed that God would keep his promise. But I have a question. Did she, though? Did she believe God would keep his promise? If she believed God would keep his promise to give her a baby, then why did Sarai take matters into her own hands? She gave her maid, an Egyptian woman named Hagar, to her husband Abram and said, Go ahead, make a baby together, and I'm claiming that baby for me. Wow, okay, <laughs> that's another level. Uh, so put yourself in, in Sarai's shoes. Maybe Sarai believed God's promise, but she thought he just needs a little nudge or he needs some help. Maybe she thought God was willing because he'd made the promise, but not able. So maybe she was thinking, hmm, maybe this is too hard for God because I'm barren and too old, so... Maybe God can't do this because it's kind of an impossible thing. 
Do you ever think that? Do you ever find yourself praying about something and then just kind of hold back a bit and say, uh, but maybe this is kind of an exception. Maybe this is an impossible thing. Or thinking about the other way, maybe Sarai thought that God was able but was not willing. I believe we all struggle with this one when we face seemingly impossible situations. Maybe you've got a health issue that the doctors can't figure out. Or maybe you've got a financial issue that keeps you up at night. Maybe your spouse or your kids aren't Jesus followers and and you don't see how they will ever put their faith in Jesus. Maybe you're trying to buy a house in a crazy market and that seems impossible. Or maybe you're trying to have a child and you've always wanted one just like Sarai. So many times we can we believe that God can. But really we don't believe that he will. A lot of times when I'm praying for someone I'll ask, "Do you believe God can do this?" And the answer is almost always yes. And then I'll say, "Do you believe he will?" That's another that's another thing altogether. Well, one day, the Lord appeared to Abram, and I I don't know why in Old Testament times, the Lord appeared to people. He talked to people so clearly, not subjectively, like face to face. And many times when the, the, in the Old Testament, so the, the the days before Jesus came and walked this earth, he was born in Bethlehem, all that stuff, before that, it's, uh, the Bible will say, the angel of the Lord appeared, not an angel. Sometimes it says an angel, but many times it says the angel of the Lord appeared to somebody. And, and we believe that was Jesus. Before Bethlehem, before the first Christmas, that Jesus was showing up. And it, because it says time after time, the Lord appeared to them. That, that's pretty cool. I mean, that's, that's, that's one explanation And one day, the Lord appeared to Abram. And it it was kind of a strange situation. There were three men who came. So it it appears from the conversation, it was the Lord and two angels. And the story is found in Genesis 18, verses 9 to 12. Genesis 18, verses 9 to 12. So these three strangers, these three people... Uh, come and Abram immediately bows down to them and serves them. He, he immediately knows these are divine beings. And in verse 9, they, they ask a question. Where is Sarah, your wife? The visitors asked. She's inside the tent, just right over here, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time. And Sarah was long past the age of having children. So when the Lord said, I'm going to come back in a year and she's going to have a, she'll have a son. Verse, verse 12, so she laughed silently to herself and said, how, can a, how could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also so old? He was 10 years older than her. If she believed God would keep his promise to give her a baby, why did Sarah laugh when the Lord said, in a year, you're going to have a baby? Well, the Lord asked the same question. He's he's asking the same question that's on my mind. Verse uh, Genesis 18, 13. Then the Lord, I believe it was Jesus speaking to her, said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? I'm going to try to read this with as neutral tone of voice as possible. Why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Well, Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, no, you did laugh. (laughs) I just love that so much. (laughs) That's exactly something I would say. No, you did laugh. (laughs) Yeah, you did. He doesn't put her down. He doesn't rebuke her. He just simply is stating a fact. You know, you did laugh. 
So why did Sarah laugh? Well, I think, first of all, because it was funny. It was funny to imagine. At this time, she's just under 90. She's 89. At, at, at this time, she's picturing herself being great with child at this age, and it kind of makes her laugh. Or, or, or maybe she's picturing herself even further down the road, and she's at the park, sitting around the playground with a bunch of other moms, towel over her shoulder, nursing with all the other young moms. She's 90. They're 22. That's funny. I, I think well, that's one reason why she laughed. But why was that funny? Well, because it was so unusual. It, it didn't make sense. But why didn't this make sense to her? Because she really did not understand that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Why didn't she understand this? I'm drilling down. Because God had been promising a child to them for 25 years. 25 years. 25 years prior, the Lord first gave the promise to Abraham. You're going to have uh, many, many descendants. Uncountable. So it's been 25 years, and it probably seemed to her that if God was ever going to give them a child, he would have already done it by now. Abraham had, Abraham had told her about all the promises the Lord had given them, and the Lord appeared to Abraham several times in some very powerful and strange ways. God made it very clear, Abraham, I am going to make a nation out of you. But when Sarah focused on her infertility, she felt helpless. Drilling down, why did God wait 25 years to give them a baby? Because God waited until there was no way anyone else could get the credit. There was no way anyone could deny this is a miracle, this birth. Why did God want people to witness a miracle? Because God wanted Abraham and Sarah and all of us who would read their story to witness his power and God's love in action. God loves you and me that much. So because of Hebrews 11.11, 11, I know Sarah finally did believe. I've been asking the question, did she believe? She did believe. When she got her eyes off of her situation and onto her Savior, the Lord just broke through to her. But she couldn't believe the promise until she had had an encounter with the promise er. She needed to hear for herself from God. Secondhand faith isn't enough when you're waiting 25 years for an answer to your prayer, or you're waiting for a miracle for 25 years. You need your own encounter with God. Firsthand faith in God makes even the barren blessed. Firsthand faith in God makes even the barren blessed even while you're still barren. Here's what we know, just a few things about how God answers prayer. First of all, God's timing is often different than yours or mine. Can somebody say amen to that? God is rarely in a hurry. That's what I've found. He's rarely in a hurry. We're in a hurry. God is not. Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years for the promised son, Isaac. Israel, the nation that would come from them, waited 400 years in Egypt before God sent Moses to lead them to freedom. What promise are you waiting to see fulfilled in your life? Has it been 400 years yet? Or might, might, might have a little bit more time to go then. A second thing we know about how God answers prayer, God's strategy often involves struggle. God's strategy often involves struggle. We automatically think, well, if I'm struggling, I must have sinned, I must have done something wrong, my faith must be low. No, God's strategy, his choice for us, often involves struggle. Abraham struggled to see how God was going to give them a child to him and his barren wife. Sarah struggled to see how she could get pregnant when she was too old. It was impossible. The Israelites, God's people, had to fight battles to possess the promised land. And I always go back to this. 
God had promised over and over, I am giving you this land. That's what he said to the Jewish people. I am giving you this land. It's yours. Now, strap on your sword, get your bows and arrows, and go fight for it. Wait a minute, I thought you said you gave it to me. Uh Uh-huh. And part of my strategy for giving it to you involves struggle for your good. God's, God is much more concerned about you and who you are on the inside than a quick fix to whatever's going on in your life. Could it be that your struggle, the struggle you're facing right now, is part of God's strategy to work things out for, good, for your good in your life? Could it be that's his strategy? Maybe he's developing character. Maybe he's developing spiritual maturity. Or maybe he's setting up a greater miracle so more people will rejoice. Yeah, I'm telling you, it was a much greater miracle. It, w- it would have been a miracle if Sarah had had a baby at age 22. Life is a miracle. But it's a much greater miracle when she had a baby at 90. When she was, Im- it was impossible. She was past the childbearing age. Only God could have done that. It was a great miracle. And sometimes God just kind of saves that up for us for a greater miracle. So more people will rejoice. Here's another thing we know. God's answer often looks different than what you pictured. (laughs) God's answer often looks different than what you pictured. Abraham and Sarah thought they'd have a baby that they could explain totally by natural means. That's what they pictured. Just a regular old baby coming in the regular old way. But God gave them the supernatural solution when it seemed physically impossible for them. The Jewish people for centuries were looking for the Messiah, the promised one. They were looking for a king. So, like, this is what they were looking for. I'm looking for a king riding in on a white horse with an army behind him to come and fight back all our enemies so that we will be a free people. That's what they were looking for. But Jesus didn't come that way. He was the king of kings. He is the king of kings. But he came meek and lowly, riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. He he came in such a way that he didn't fight with an army on earth to, to fight back the Romans. He came to fight back the devil the ultimate enemy. And Jesus laid down his life on a cross, the exact opposite of what Israel was expecting. They were expecting obvious conquering human territory victor. Jesus came and saved the world by laying down his life and then rising to to, to life on the third day. Is it possible you have already received your answer? and you don't recognize it. Or you didn't recognize it when it came. The Jews, the Pharisees, the the religious leaders of Jesus' day did not recognize it. They are still looking for that Messiah to come. He already came. He came. Is it possible God has already answered your miracle, given you your miracle, but in a way you would never have expected? It's not what you pictured so you didn't notice it. Sometimes we pray something like this, for example, as a silly example. God, give me great faith to do great things. So what did God do? He puts a problem in your path. And you're thinking, God, I, I th- I'm waiting for that answer. And God said, I just gave it to you. Use your faith. Let's overcome this together. Wow. Finally, God's final answer may not come until you get to heaven. Now, God gives many answers here. That's why we keep praying. That's why we keep asking. And we we have seen God do some amazing things. But we have not seen God do everything that we asked for yet. And we've seen God heal time and time again. And we rejoice and we praise God. Some healings we're still waiting for. Ultimate healing, perfect healing, 100%, total healing. That's not going to happen for anybody until we get to heaven ultimate healing is going to happen there. But either way, God is for you, and he is answering. I wish we could be outside of time and see what God sees, because what looks like a super long time to us is just a quick minute to God. In God's economy, 
I know it's kind of poetic, but it's been just a little over two days since Jesus' death and resurrection. Because a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. It's, it's, it's not an exact formula. It's just saying for God, whoop, it's there. And if we will just trust God and believe in him and commit to obey him, we will see God move. You will see God move in your life. Would you stand and let's, let's pray. If you're online, would you make where you are a place of prayer? Don't just, don't just like breeze by this. This is a super important time in our service. Would you bow your heads with me? Just kind of shut out distractions. You can pray with your eyes open, but there is something cool in a group of just closing your eyes, just getting alone as you can be with God. Let's pray. Lord, we know that you are at work in our lives in so many different ways. I saw you do something so small but so profound for me this weekend. Wow, I just thank you. You are here. You are working. You do care. You do see us. We are never outside your care. Our, our problems are never too big for your hand. You love us. You care for us. You've given your life for us. I thank you that you are at work in our lives, Lord. We know you answer prayer. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Lord, increase our strength. Help let, let faith arise in us, Lord God. Help us believe your promises. Not only that you can, but that you will, Lord, in our lives. Help us to trust your, your goodness, your character. You are love. You are peace. You are strength. You are hope. You are everything that we need. Help us to trust that. Help us rely on you in that, Lord God. And also help us to obey what you've already asked us to do. Perhaps some answers are delayed because we have not yet obeyed. Help us to obey. I think about how the prophet asked uh, a certain guy who had a skin disease of leprosy, he asked him to go dip in a muddy old river and he didn't want to do it. But when he obeyed, he was healed. Lord, is there something standing in our way? Show it. Lord, reveal it. Help us know so that we can obey and move on. Praise your name, Lord God. Let faith, courageous faith, rise up in your people. In Jesus' name. With your head still bowed, I want to give you an invitation to put your faith in Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus to save you. Put your faith in Jesus to make you right with God. It's not something you can do on your own. We are all, we, including me, we are all born into sin. We are all sinners, and we need a Savior, and Jesus is your Savior. How do you put your, put your faith in him? How do you become a, a, a follower of Jesus? Well, you turn away from your sin, all those things that separate you from God. Turn the opposite direction towards God and give your life to him. Give your life to Jesus and let him lead. Become his apprentice, studying him, following him becoming more like him. If you want to do that today, put your faith in Jesus, would you just raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for? And I want to pray for you. That's awesome. Are there others who would raise your hand? And online, I, I can't see you through the camera, but God can see you. Would you raise your hand to God if you want to put your faith in Jesus today? And I'd love to just coach you along with our online, uh, our online community in a prayer. Would you repeat after me? And if you are putting your faith in Jesus today, pray this to Jesus. Here we go. Repeat after me. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, we believe that Jesus just forgave your sins. And I want to encourage you to fill out the, the Connect card. And just a little bit of info there. And be sure and check the box at the bottom if you just prayed that prayer. Because I want to know and I want to be able to pray for you and encourage you. God bless you. Thanks, Pastor Garen. I just, I just love that word you gave. It's so powerful. 
Well, at this time, the ushers are going to be coming down the aisle to fill out those Connect cards. Um, if you would, and you still have a little bit of time, you haven't filled it out yet, if you're new, I encourage you to fill that out and pass it to the ushers. Um, also, we have treats, cupcakes for everybody out in the lobby. So make sure you grab one of those. I heard they're pretty amazing. If, if Pastor Shelley made it, they're amazing. Like, we all know that for sure. <laughs> all right, we love you guys. We'll see you next week. God bless. Have a good day.